Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the anatomy of the lower leg, the knee, and the femur as part of the RADS 130 course. So we'll begin distally with talking about the uh, lower leg. The lower leg is uh, or consists of two bones. You've got the tibia and the fibula. So your tibia is the medial bone of your lower leg. The fibula, the more slender bone, is the lateral. Movements of pronation and supination are not possible in the leg. And you have two joints. You've got a proximal and a distal tibiofibular joint, but it does not allow for uh, pronation and supination as in the arm and the hand, for example. So tibia, fibula, tibia, largest bone, medial side, fibula, lateral side, the more slender bone, and the fibula actually acts as a splint to the tibia, giving the lower leg more strength. We'll talk about the tibia first. So the tibia is classified as a, a long bone. Uh, layman's term, your tibia is your shin bone start proximally. So if we take a look at the uh, diagram that's presented here, you can see you've got something called tibial plateaus. You've got two condyles and then something called an intercondylar eminence and then a tibial tuberosity. So two of the uh, processes uh, are very palpable. You've got your medial and your lateral condyles. You can feel those uh, on your own leg. The superior surfaces of the condyles are uh, somewhat flattened, so we call these articular facets or plateaus. And this is where the femur then is going to rest on top of the uh, tibia. You have these two sharp projections that come up from the tibial uh, plateau. This is called your intercondylar eminence. Remember, inter means between, so between the condyles. Uh, eminence is something that's raised up. So the intercondylar eminence, there's sharp projections between the articular facets. Uh, another term that you sometimes see for intercondylar eminence is tibial spine. It's not used as much. Uh, usually you see it referred to as the intercondylar eminence. The lateral condyle has a facet on its posterior surface for articulation with the fibula. So there's an area that's going to be articulating uh, on the lateral condyle with the fibula. Where it articulates is going to form the proximal tibiofibular joint. And this joint is a synovial gliding type of joint. Anteriorly, but still proximally, is something that is called the tibial tuberosity. It's on the anterior surface of the tibia take a look at the diagram, it would be uh, slightly inferior to the condyles. If you feel on your own leg, it's very palpable. It serves as the attachment for uh, muscles. And the patellar ligament is actually inserted into it. Uh, this process, this tuberosity, becomes important in a pathology called osgood schlatter's disease. On osgood schlatter's disease, the tibial tuberosity actually uh, breaks away from the body of the bone. Um, and the question that you sometimes see on exams or the registry regarding the tibial tuberosity in osgood schlatter's disease would be what projection would best demonstrate osgood schlatter's and that would be the lateral, because if you think about it, if the tibial tuberosity is pulled away from the body, and then you turn the leg laterally and look at it, you would see then that separation. 
So that pretty much takes care of the proximal part of the tibia. So once again, we've got the two condyles, the medial and the lateral. The lateral condyle is going to be in articulation with the fibula. The top of the tibia is the uh, plateau area. So you've got the tibial plateaus. You've got these two little pointed processes that come up from the tibial plateaus called the intercondylar eminence. And then you have this very palpable bony landmark on the anterior part of the proximal tibia, which is the tibial tuberosity. If we move down distally then, uh, between the proximal and the distal end is the body. Remember, we can say body, shaft, or diaphysis of the bone. And this bone actually becomes flattened as it approaches the ankle area. We'll talk now about the distal tibia. So when you talk about the ankle, we learned on the ankle that you have two malleoli. You had a medial and a lateral malleolus. Well, since the tibia is the medial bone of the lower leg, uh, when we talk about the tibia, we're going to talk about the medial malleolus. It's a very palpable landmark, uh, forms part of the ankle mortis, reaches about one half inch below the level of the ankle joint. You have a little notch in this area. It's a, a little triangular depression for articulation with the distal fibula. So if you look at the diagram, you can see that you've got the tibia. Uh, what would be, uh, if you look at that diagram and imagine there'd be a little notched area then uh, on the distal part of the tibia that's going to then articulate uh, with the distal fibula. This is then going to form the distal tibial fibular joint. Remember, we had a proximal tibial fibular joint. Here we've got the distal tibial fibular joint. Uh, it's amphiarthrotic. Remember, uh, amphiarthrotic means slight mobility, slightly movable. It's a cartilaginous joint. Just for a quick review, remember, we've got diarthrotic joints, which are freely movable, amphiarthrotic joints, which are somewhat movable, and then we've got synarthrodial joints that, that don't move at all, like the uh, fibrous sutures of your skull. Let's move on to the fibula then. The fibula, too, is a long bone. It's uh, what we refer to as the calf bone. It's a very slender bone. It's, it's non-weight bearing. As I mentioned, it, it acts as a splint uh, to the tibia to give the lower leg more support and stability. Uh, if we look at the drawing, we can see that proximally you have what's called the head and then the apex of the fibula. So the head is its proximal and it is what articulates then with the lateral condyle of the tibia. It is the area, the head of the fibula, that's going to articulate with the lateral condyle of the tibia to give you the proximal tibiofibular joint. The apex, uh, or we can say the styloid process, either one, apex or styloid process, uh, is a conical projection on the lateral posterior head. So it's that pointed part on the uh, top of the head area of the fibula. Uh, the fibula, remember, is on the lateral side of the lower leg. And remember, when we learned ankle again, we learned the malleoli, the medial malleolus, which we now know is part of the tibia. And now we're going to talk about the lateral malleolus, which is part of the fibula. It's its distal end. It, too, forms the ankle mortis, projects lower than the medial malleolus. Okay, so the lateral malleolus projects lower than the medial malleolus. Take a look at the drawing. You can even see that it's a little bit lower uh, than would be the medial malleolus. So along with the medial malleolus, it forms then the ankle mortis. Let's move on to the knee. So the knee, of course, is the articulation between the femur and the tibia. Notice not between the fibula. The fibula is not the 
even if you look at the drawing, it's not in contact with the, the femur there. So the knee is formed by the femoral condyles. So the femur too has condyles that we'll talk about in articulation with the tibial plateaus. Your knee joint is a synovial, diarthrodial, hinge, double condylar gliding joint. So it's a lot of different things. It is protected uh, by the patella. You've got the patella there, which is your largest sesamoid bone, which of course is located on the anterior surface of the femur. Remember when we talk about synovial joints, synovial joints have that capsule around them that's going to have synovial fluid uh, which aids in lubrication for these diarthrodial types of joints. The knee is rather complex. You've, you've got a, a lot of uh, ligaments in it, uh, giving it great stability. Um, we have two in particular, something called that, excuse me, something that's called the posterior cruciate ligament and the anterior cruciate ligament. And these ligaments, uh, they pass up from the intercondylar part of the tibia, uh, one to each margin of what we call the intercondylar fossa, that area that has, is on the distal femur between the condyles. And they cross each other like the letter X. This is where we get the name cruciate, cruciate meaning cross or X. Uh, you also have along the lateral sides of the knee uh, two what we call collateral ligaments. You've got the tibial collateral ligament and the fibular collateral ligament. So ligaments on the side and then ligaments attaching then the femur to the tibia in the shape of an X, which are your cruciate ligaments. Also in the knee, there are cushions that are called menisci. Uh, they lie on the tibial plateaus. Uh, they, they act as little shock absorbers. Uh, you've got your lateral meniscus and your medial meniscus. And sometimes during uh, physical exercise, activity, trauma occurs and they're actually torn. I talked about the synovial membrane, um, and when we talk about this membrane, uh, synovial membrane in the knee, uh, we also talk about bursae. Now remember, bursae we learned were fluid-filled sacs. So uh, on the slide it says the synovial membrane of the knee joint is prolonged upwards on the anterior surface of the femur behind the patella and the quadriceps tendon to form what's called the suprapatellar bursa. It opens into the knee joint. And notice this, 12 other bursae are located about the knee, so around the knee. Some open into the knee joint, while others are separate from it. So uh, lots of bursae in the knee area. A little bit about the patella. The patella is the uh, largest, what is referred to as the most constant because it, of its size and, and uh, it doesn't really vary too much. So the most constant sesamoid bone in the body. It's situated on the distal anterior femur. It develops in the quadriceps femoris tendon between the ages of three to five years of age. It is triangular shaped. And what's a little bit interesting about the patella is normally when we think about the apex, we think about uh, the apex as being superior, like on the fibula, we learn the apex is superior, it points upward. Well, in the patella, the apex, its pointed part actually points uh, downward uh, toward the knee area. Uh, the base is its superior aspect. Okay, so the base is the superior and the uh, bottom of the patella is the apex. Let's move on to the femur. The femur is a long bone, and in fact, it's the longest, strongest bone in the body. Proximally, it's got a head, which is its rounded end, and this 
head of the femur is going to fit into a cup-shaped socket that we'll learn about uh, when we talk about the pelvis called the acetabulum. So the head of the femur fitting into the cup-shaped acetabulum forms actually the hip joint. If we start to go distally then, we've got the neck area of the femur. It's the slender region just below the head. And you want to take note of this. In the average adult, the neck of the femur, and, and if you look in Merrill's, you're going to see a nice diagram of this. Of this. The neck projects anteriorly from the body at an angle of 15 to 20 degrees. Okay, this is referred to as the antiversion of the femoral neck. Now that 15 to 20 degrees is important because if we're going to do an AP of the femur or an AP of the hip, um, probably in clinicals you've, over, you've seen the technologists when they're going to do an AP hip or an AP femur uh, or an, uh, a pelvis, what do they do? They invert the patient's feet. Why do they invert the patient's feet? Well, you're going to take that 20 degree angle. The neck is coming down at a 20 degree angle. If I invert the feet, it's going to then bring the neck area to be parallel with the image receptor. Remember, when the part is parallel to the image receptor, you won't get what? You won't get foreshortening, right? So if we take the, the feet we invert them, we take the neck of the femur, and we bring it from that angle of 15 to 20 degrees to be now parallel with the image receptor. On the proximal femur, uh, you've got the two trochanters. You've got the very palpable uh, greater trochanter on the lateral side, and the trochanter that you cannot pal palpate, which is called the lesser trochanter. So greater trochanter, large, prominent, palpable process, proximal end of la on the lateral side. The lesser trochanter located uh, medial and posterior surface. It's not going to be palpable. There are two areas of bony ridges. One area on the anterior side of the femur between the trochanters and one on the posterior side of the femur between the trochanters. The intertrochanteric crest is a ridge of bone passing obliquely across the back of the upper femur, so on its posterior side between the trochanters. The intertrochanteric line is a ridge of bone extending between the trochanters canters on the anterior surface. So you want to remember intertrochanteric. What does it mean between the trochanters? The intertrochanteric crest is posterior. The intertrochanteric line is anterior. Along the posterior aspect of the body of the femur, now remember, the body is the shaft or diaphysis, the long part extending between the proximal and distal uh, ends of the bone. Along the posterior part, you have something called the linea aspira. The linea aspira is a double bony ridge that passes longitudinally down the posterior surface of the body. And then as it gets distally, it divides to form the margins of what's referred to as the popliteal or popliteal surface. So the popliteal surface is the back area of the femur, the flat area on the dorsal surface of the distal femur between the divided ridges of the linea aspira. So posterior, bony ridge, down the back of the femur, linea aspira splits, and now you have then the popliteal surface. On the distal femur, we saw that you have the condyles, right? And the condyles are going to be in articulation with the tibial plateaus. Slightly above the condyles, if we look at the drawing then, we have what are referred to as epicondyles. Epi meaning above or upon. So the epicondyles are on the distal end of the femur, just above the condyles. They're designated as medial and lateral. 
So above the lateral condyle, we've got the lateral epicondyle. Above the medial condyle, we've got the medial epicondyle. And the condyles themselves are expanded, palpable distal ends of the bone. Medial and lateral articulate with the tibia, of course, to form then the knee joint. So here on the drawing, we're looking at the posterior aspect. Notice we know it's posterior. We've got, you can barely see, but that linea spiris coming down and then it kind of splits. And we've got the popliteal surface. We've got the lateral epicondyle and lateral condyle and the medial epicondyle, medial condyle. And then between it, we've got the, what's called intercondylar fossa. For, fossa, remember, is an indentation. Inter meaning between, so uh, this indentation in the bone between the condyles. And one other thing to note is uh, a small process on the medial surface of the medial epicondyle is called the adductor tubercle. As I mentioned, uh, on the distal femur between the condyles is the intercondylar fossa. That's a depression uh, between the condyles on the posterior surface. So once again, looking at the drawing, you've got the popliteal surface, the lateral epicondyle, lateral condyle, medial epicondyle, medial condyle. Above the medial epicondyle is the adductor tubercle. And then between the condyles themselves is the intercondylar fossa.